O Lord, may the words that I speak and the thoughts that our hearts think be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On October 31st, in the year 1517, a 34-year-old Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed 95 theses, or sentences, to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. They were written in Latin, and they were an invitation to stimulate theological debate. Luther wanted answers. He wanted to know why some of the teachings of his church did not square with what he had been coming to understand from the words of Holy Scripture. He wanted to know why, if the Pope had the power to spring souls out of purgatory, he didn't just do so out of the goodness of his heart. He wanted to know how a piece of paper, a letter of indulgence, could take away God's temporal punishments as though God were a crooked jailer who could be bought off with a bribe. Luther wanted to know what all this had to do with Jesus, who had died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. As we celebrate Reformation again this year, you and I need to be very clear about what Reformation was and is all about. The Refor Reformation is not about how the Lutherans got it right and the Catholics got it wrong. It was not about rebelling against authority or starting a new and better church. The Reformation was and is about the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has taken away the sins of the world by his death that for his sake alone, through faith in him, an otherwise poor, damned sinner is declared not guilty by a just and holy God. The Reformation is about how a relatively unknown German monk stumbled across a marvelous message that had gotten lost in the middle of a lot of legalism and self-righteousness, and how that not only changed him, but also the whole church including you and me. The Reformation is about the gospel of Jesus, and the gospel of Jesus is about our salvation. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law, writes St. Paul in, the letter, in his letter to the Romans, the closing verse of today's epistle. This passage needs to be engraved in our minds and burned on our hearts. It's one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, not for its poetry, but because of what it says. You and I, sinners, prodigal sons and daughters of Adam, who have no case, no defense, you and I are justified, that is declared righteous, holy, innocent in God's court of justice, all on account of Christ dying and rising, and we receive this salvation through simple faith in Jesus Christ, sola fide, and not by any works that we do. Not our commandment keeping, not our family values, not our religious good works, not our purpose-driven life, not our perfect church attendance or tithing or anything else that we do, but only by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. What caused Martin Luther to post those 95 theses in the first place? It was letters of indulgence, pardons from purgatory signed and sealed by the Pope himself. Indulgence preachers like John Tetzel used to stand on street corners and tell people, as soon as a coin clinks in the chest, a soul flies up, to heavenly rest. Yes, you can bail Uncle Albert out of his 10,000 years in purgatory. And while you're at it, why not buy a letter of indulgence for yourself? 
It was the best fundraiser the church ever came up with. It sure beat bake sales and spaghetti dinners. The Pope built St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome using indulgence money. Now, indulgences were not exactly about buying forgiveness of sins. That's a common misunderstanding. Forgiveness of sins came from Christ through baptism and penance. But the temporal punishments for sin in purgatory could be paid for by letters of indulgence. A kind of get out of jail but not for free card. Indulgences, though, were only a symptom of a much deeper problem in the Church of Luther's day, and that was the whole idea of merit. What a person could, what a person must earn. It was your merits, your good deeds versus your sins weighed in the balance on God's scales of justice. Luther knew what it was like to be pressed down hard by the law. He did everything that the church told him that he had to do. The disciplines, the fasts, the penances, the prayers. He did them so rigorously that even his religious superior was concerned that he was overdoing it. But there was no peace for Luther in all of these things. He saw God only as an angry judge who could never be satisfied by all the works that Luther could do. Luther even found himself actually hating God because of it all. In today's epistle, St. Paul says that the law speaks to silence every mouth before God. The whole world stands account accountable to God, whether it knows it or not, whether it believes it or not. There are no exceptions. There are no excuses. And the verdict under the law is that no one, no matter how good, how religious, how busy with good works he or she might be, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight through the law. Not Martin Luther, not Mother Teresa, not the Virgin Mary or St. Paul, or you or me. The law will make you conscious of your sin, like a mirror shows us all of our faults, and the more seriously we take God's law, the more we will realize just how lost and condemned we are. But the law cannot justify you. The law cannot save you. That much Luther understood. He felt the despair that the law with no gospel will always bring. Fortunately, he didn't stop reading at Romans 3.20, where Paul declared that by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Luther kept reading as Paul wrote, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's a completely different way of righteousness from God. Not the way of the law, but the way of the gospel. Not the way of works, but the way of faith in Jesus. There's no difference between any of us. All have sinned, the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, from the richest to the poorest. All fall short of the glory of God. All, without exception. But all are justified freely by God's grace. Sola gratia. Through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the sinless Son of God who shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. His blood is what cleanses you and me from our sins. The blood that was shed on the cross. The blood that washes us clean in our baptism. The blood that Jesus gives us to drink in his holy supper. That's how a sinner stands justified before God. Not by works, but by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't that make you want to stand up and shout for joy? You are innocent before God. Not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did and what he still does for you. You're free, just as Jesus reminds us in today's Holy Gospel. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. But why is it that we who are Lutherans still often don't seem to get it. 
Why did 50% of Lutherans surveyed several years ago agree with the statement, good works contribute to our salvation? 57% of Lutherans thought that this is what the Bible teaches. And why do the majority of evangelicals today believe that they are saved by their decision to be saved? And why do people, even pastors sometimes, leave the Lutheran church for churches that obscure and even deny this central teaching? Because the old man, our sinful nature, loves his false religions, that's why. Luther once said that the human heart is an idol factory, churning out false religions 24-7. Everything from pyramids to temples to ritual baths in the Ganges, pilgrimage and holy wars, not walking under ladders or having black cats cross our paths, knocking on wood for good luck and making sure not to step on a crack lest we break our mother's back. Anything to cut a deal, anything to make a bargain with God or the forces of nature. The old Adam, you see, our sinful nature is a control freak. It wants to be in control of all the chips. It wants to pull all the salvation strings. It wants to hold God under obligation. You owe me, God. Look how good I've been. The teaching that a sinner is justified by grace through faith for Jesus' sake is at the very heart of our Christian faith. It sets Christianity apart from every other religion or spirituality in the world. No other wor religion in the world comes close to teaching this. In fact, every other religion in the world teaches exactly the opposite. The way of the law. You have to do it. Oh, God may help you. He may empower you or equip you. But still, you have to do it. Morals, prayers, disciplines, liturgy, sacrifices... No matter what other religion you might choose, they all have them. But free forgiveness, pardon, acquittal, a righteous judge who pronounces the verdict of innocent over the guilty, there's only one place to hear that, and that's in the Holy Christian Church. There are times, though, when I get more than a little discouraged over the state of the church today. There are so many people who do not take their faith in Jesus seriously. There are churches that ignore the clear teachings of Scripture. There are pastors who preach sermons that never mention the name of Jesus, let alone his atoning sacrifice and resurrection. If Luther were around today, he would probably get out his hammer and start nailing more theses to the church doors of our land, perhaps even to the door of this church. But let us never forget that we Lutherans, in spite of all of our shortcomings, still have an important place in God's scheme of things. We are the heirs of a great tradition that recognizes the centrality of Christ's saving work. It's the hub around which the whole wheel turns. Christ is the hub, the center. Justification by grace through faith is the middle of everything. Grace alone. Faith alone, Christ alone, and we know that by Scripture alone. There's nothing else that should be or can be in the middle. That's what the Reformation was and is all about. Luther called the church back to her center where Jesus is. And 499 years later, the church, so easily distracted, so prone to forget, must continually be called back to the center. The world needs this good news, even if it does not always realize it. And by the grace of God, we have it. So let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's proclaim it. Let's live it. Martin Luther summed it up so well in his explanation to the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. 
But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith, just as he does for you and for me and for the whole Christian church on earth. We believe that the Word of God does what it says. That baptism creates faith, even in the hearts of the littlest ones. That the Lord's Supper actually is the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. That the words of absolution which the pastor proclaims in the stead and by the command of Christ actually is God's forgiveness spoken personally to each one of us. We are not justified. We are not saved by being Lutheran. We are not justified by the purity of our doctrine, the beauty of our hymns, our Bible-based liturgies, the piety of our prayers, or all the good works that we might do. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You are forgiven. You are justified. You are free. All because of Jesus, because of all that he has done for you. So 499 years after the Reformation, it's still all about Jesus. Always has been, and by God's grace, always will be. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we will receive our tithes and offerings.